Antimicrobial resistance is an emerging threat to both human and veterinary medicine, and in order to have a holistic understanding of this problem, both prescribers and laboratory diagnosticians require a, a deep understanding of the basic biology underlying these issues. So what is intrinsic resistance and why is it important? discussion of antimicrobial resistance necessarily starts with an overview of how the drugs work, what they actually target in the bacteria. In this schematic, you can see our different antimicrobial families in these red boxes. So we have our sulfonamides, our beta-lactams, etc., and the corresponding target which they act on in the bacterial cell. Having an appreciation for where the drugs act um, is really important because Differences in the presence or absence of each target directly impacts which drugs are likely to be effective against given bacteria. We have many different antimicrobials available to us, and there is no one compound that is able to inhibit or kill all organisms. Each antimicrobial has a characteristic spectrum of activity, so it's effective against some groups of bacteria, some species and genera, and not active against others. So what explains these differences? Intrinsic resistance, I think, plays a big part in this. So intrinsic resistance is constitutive. It's something that we see naturally in a group of organisms. It's not acquired, but it's a feature of a bacterial species. So it's what you expect to find if you were to look at any representative of species X. Acquired resistance, on the other hand, is not inherent to the organism. Organisms with acquired resistance mechanisms have something that makes them different from the wild type. They are less susceptible to a given drug than they would have been without that resistance gene. And this is really what we're concerned with when we talk about emerging antimicrobial resistance. Acquired resistance is the big problem. So how do bacteria resist the drugs that we use to try and kill them? Well, there's several uh, strategies that they can employ, either intrinsically or, or can be acquired. The first of which is decreased permeability. So they can simply prevent the drug from entering the cell and reaching its target within the bacteria. Similarly, they can have active efflux where drugs are pumped out as soon as they make their way into the bacterial cell, preventing them from reaching adequate concentrations at their target. We can have bacterial enzymes which are produced to degrade or destroy antimicrobials. So kind of a bacterial countermeasure, something that's able to break down the compounds we're um, giving to our patient to try and treat the infection. We can have resistance by absence, so the drug target simply doesn't exist in a particular species or genus. We can have target modification or disguise, so the normal target within the bacteria which the drug binds to is subtly different, such that the drug is not able to recognize its substrate, it doesn't bind, and it doesn't kill the organism. Finally, we can have alternate metabolic pathways, where the bacteria can accomplish the same physiological goal through an alternate pathway which is unaffected by a given compound. I want to go through a few key examples of intrinsic antimicrobial resistance that highlight some of these potential mechanisms of resistance. So first we'll talk about decreased permeability. E. coli and other enterobacteriales um, as gram-negatives have an outer membrane which is highly impermeable and makes it difficult for drugs like clindamycin and other macrolides to make their way into the cell. As a result, this impermeable outer membrane makes these organisms intrinsically resistant to clindamycin. Pseudomonas and other particularly lactose non-fermenting gram-negative rods constitutively express uh, beta-lactamases. These are enzymes which can break down many of our beta-lactam antimicrobials, including drugs like penicillin, and these are consequently um, intrinsically resistant to penicillin. Enterococcus has a unique uh, structure to its cell wall. Um, their cell wall is composed primarily of penicillin binding protein 5, um, which has a low affinity for cephalosporin drugs. They are therefore not able to bind, and they do not have activity against this group of organisms. And finally, my favorite example of intrinsic resistance are the mycoplasma. 
This genus of bacteria does not have a peptidoglycan-based cell wall and is the beta-lactam type antibiotics act by interfering with peptidoglycan synthesis, they are intrinsically resistant. They simply lack the target. You can find more information about intrinsic resistance, including expected phenotypes, from UCAST, the European Committee on Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing, and the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute. I'll put a link in the description below. This is an example of some data from UCAST. Here you can see in this intrinsic resistance table for the Enterobacteriales and Aeromonas. Um, at the top, there's a description of which drugs the entire group is resistant to. So intrinsic resistance to benzyl penicillin, the glycopeptides, fusidic acid, macrolides, lincosamides, et cetera, is expected for all of these bacteria. In the table, you can see the species-specific intrinsic resistance that's recognized. So Enterobacter cloacae, for instance, is intrinsically resistant to ampicillin amoxicillin, amoxclav and ampicillbactam, as well as several of our cephalosporins. So why is this information important? Well, first of all, anti-infective biology is just really interesting. And if you're interested in microbiology and want a deeper understanding, this is an area you should know more about. But it is, of course, also directly applicable to both clinical and laboratory settings. For the practitioner, having an understanding of intrinsic antimicrobial resistance really facilitates evidence-based empiric therapeutic selection. So if you have a patient that you suspect has, for instance, an E. coli urinary tract infection, by knowing something about the properties of E. coli, you can already rule out a number of therapeutic choices. You know which drugs are unlikely to be effective. For the laboratory, knowledge of intrinsic resistance can be a really powerful quality control tool. So failure to observe expected phenotypes could indicate that there was a problem with how the test was performed, how the bacteria was identified. So finding a uh, uh, pseudomonas susceptible to penicillin, for instance, might indicate that you're not actually dealing with a pseudomonas and you need to go back and re-identify and, and check the, the results. Could also indicate a technical error or something as simple as data entry. I hope this overview gives you an appreciation for the importance of understanding intrinsic antimicrobial resistance. And if you have any questions, put them down in the comment section below. Thank you.